Hello, I'm Emily Thomas, an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Durham University. I mostly work on space and time and the history of metaphysics from the 17th to the early 20th centuries. And I've thought about some of the people that we'll be talking about in this show, including John Locke and Catherine Coburn. I've also published a recent book on the philosophy of travel, which also has some things to say about John Locke and ideas. So you can check that out too, if you fancy. Today, I'm going to be asking how perception works, in particular, whether we should accept John Locke's indirect realism. So I wanna start off by thinking about what indirect realism is. This really comes down to the question of how perception works. So when I look at the moon, what happens? Philosophers have traditionally offered two different kinds of answer to this question. The first is known as direct realism. It's a kind of realism in the sense the direct realist accepts that there is an external world outside our minds. The world of tables and chairs and mountains and hills, all of that stuff, it really exists. And when I look at the moon, I am directly perceiving it. That's all there is to perception. Direct realists do differ on exactly how the mechanisms of perception work but they needn't be committed to any poor kind of direct realism which holds that there are no perceptual mechanisms. They can agree that light enters the eye, there's some kind of physiology involved where signals travel through nerves and into the brain. They don't deny any of that. What they deny is that there is any mental idea or intermediary involved in that perception. And that, in contrast, is where the indirect realist comes in. So for the indirect realist, there's still a world outside our minds, outside our perceptions, but they don't believe we perceive that world directly. Instead, they think that we perceive the world indirectly via sensory impressions or sense data or ideas. The best arguments, I think, for indirect realism come from experience of dreams or illusions or hallucinations. In all of these cases, the mind seems to be having perceptions that are generated by the mind. So just to give you a few examples, we quite often experience sort of mild everyday illusions. Imagine looking at what appears to be a lake at the end of a hot road or a straw that appears to be bent in a drink of water or a cocktail of some kind. But of course, illusions can also be really dramatic. We have the infamous uh, Macbeth quote, who sees a dagger floating towards him in the room and he asks, is this a dagger I see before me? And Macbeth is really trying to figure out whether this is a figment of his imagination or an actual dagger hanging in the air. If we were to take certain kinds of drugs or enough alcohol, we might also experience these kinds of seemingly veridical hallucinations. All of these things suggest that if our minds can generate perceptions of its own accord, and those perceptions can be indistinguishable from our regular everyday perceptions, then all our perceptions are of the same kind. They are all generated by the mind. And that is the position of indirect realism. We don't perceive things in the world directly. We perceive them via these mental intermediaries. 17th century English philosopher John Locke is probably the most famous indirect realist um, within Western philosophy. And in Locke's terminology, what happens when we perceive the moon or the tree 
is that our minds generate an idea of the moon or the tree and that's what we perceive rather than perceiving the moon or the tree directly. Here's a question for the indirect realist. How do I know that the ideas I have of external objects actually resemble those objects as they are in themselves? By resemblance, I'm thinking of what we mean when we say that the picture of the queen on a coin does or doesn't resemble the queen, or the way that a painting of an owl resembles the owl in real life. Locke thinks that some of the ideas we have of external objects really resemble the objects as they are in themselves, but not others. And this leads us on to his theory of primary and secondary qualities. So for Locke, our ideas of some qualities really resemble the objects. These include our ideas of figure or shape, our ideas of extension in length, breadth and depth, our ideas of motion or rest, of solidity and of number, by which he means how many there are of a certain thing. So take our idea of an apple. That idea portrays the apple as having a certain shape. It's round, a certain size, maybe it's a couple of inches across. My idea of an apple is at rest. Locke would say that all of those ideas about the apple really resemble the apple as it is in itself. But there are other ideas we have about the apple that Locke thinks do not resemble the apple as it is in itself. And you might think of the apple as it is in itself as a kind of join the dots sketch because Locke denies that our ideas of the apple's colour, for example, it actually resembles the apple in the real world. Colour is just one of the qualities that Locke thinks we have ideas of that are not actually in the world. He calls these secondary qualities and they include sounds, tastes, hardness, softness, temperature, warmth and cold. So for Locke, our ideas of secondary qualities are like our ideas of pain. So if I were to touch something hot, maybe a cooking pot, that might hurt me. And we all agree that the pain is in my head, the pain isn't in the cooking pot. But Locke thinks that that is exactly the same for ideas of colour and heat, that these things are in my head, they're not in the pot itself. So for Locke, that's why our ideas of primary qualities resemble the primary qualities of things in themselves, but our ideas of secondary qualities don't resemble anything in the objects themselves. And he's really crystal clear about this. So for example, he tells us, Ideas of primary qualities are resemblances of secondary not. From whence I think it easy to draw the observation that the ideas of primary qualities of bodies are resemblances of them and their patterns do really exist in the bodies themselves. But the ideas produced in us by these secondary qualities have no resemblance of them at all. There is nothing like our ideas existing in the bodies themselves. Now, why does Locke think this? Why does he draw this big division between primary and secondary qualities? Well, I suspect the answer is that Locke thinks the primary qualities really reflect how objects are at some deep, fundamental, empirical, scientific level. And in fact, science, even today in the 21st century, seems to bear that out. Many scientists do think that things like colour 
and temperature as we know them don't exist in the objects themselves. That heat is just particles moving really, really quickly. And the sensation of heat is all in our heads. And you might think exactly the same goes for redness and yellowness. In the object themselves, there are just particles that are hit by light waves in a certain way. And the colors are all generated in our own minds. A little bit after Locke published on indirect realism. Another philosopher, the Irish late 17th, early 18th century philosopher George Berkeley raised various problems for his position. We're just going to look at two of the most important. So as we've seen on Locke's primary and secondary quality distinction, our ideas of primary qualities really resemble the objects themselves. But, Berkeley objects, nothing but an idea can resemble an idea. This has become a little bit of a, a motto, so we can try and think about what it means. I think that the best way to get at it is to go back to thinking about paintings. So imagine that we have a painting of an owl. Does that painting resemble an owl in real life more or less than it would resemble a painting of another kind of bird altogether, that may be a heron or a kingfisher. Berkeley would say that two paintings will always resemble each other more than a painting and that of its subject. And actually, I tend to agree. When you look at two oil paintings, for example, portraits, I think that the two portraits do always resemble each other more than they resemble their subjects. And this is the same kind of thing that Berkeley is pushing with regards to ideas, that two ideas in our heads will always resemble each other more than an idea and its subject in the real world. But if that's true, it's a real problem for Locke. It means that we have a lot less knowledge about how things are in the external world than he wants to say we do. The other big problem that Berkeley raises for Locke, and it's really, really a big problem, is how do we know that there are mind-independent objects behind our ideas at all? And Berkeley argues I do not see what reason can induce us to believe the existence of bodies without outside the mind from what we perceive. I say it is granted on all hands and what happens in dreams, frenzies and the like puts it beyond dispute that it is possible we might be affected with all the ideas we have now though no bodies existed without resembling them. Hence, it is evident the supposition of external bodies is not necessary for producing our ideas. What Berkeley is saying is we might have all of the sensory perceptions or ideas that we have now, even though there is nothing beyond those ideas causing them. And if that's true, then why are we positive? bothering to posit material bodies in the external world at all. In fact, as Berkeley will go on to argue, we shouldn't. We should get rid of material bodies altogether and accept Berkeley's own idealism on which nothing exists except for minds and their ideas. But how good or bad Berkeley's idealism is a tale for another time. Is there any way that Locke's indirect realism can be defended? Well, yeah, I think that actually there is. A couple of mechanisms can be found in Locke's essay where he originally published his indirect realism. So one way concerns the nature of our experience. Locke points out that 
how a perceptual experience is involuntary in the sense that we can't choose it. So I can't shut my eyes and imagine that I'm on a desert island and open them and find that that's what I really perceive. I can't turn things into gold just by wishing that I could. All of these things suggest that the external world really exists independently of me and my mind. Another defence can be found in an anonymous letter published in 1732. Although the letter was published anonymously, there's some reason to believe that the author might be another English philosopher called Catherine Trotter Coburn. Coburn defended Locke anonymously in several other works, which is partly why we think that this letter might actually have been penned by her. And what this letter points to is the coherence of our senses. So the author writes, since the same object is the cause of ideas by different senses, thence we infer its existence. Go back to thinking about an apple. If I had an apple here in front of me right now, I can see it, I can touch it, I can also smell it, even take a bite out of it. The coherence of that sensory experience gives us multiple reasons to believe that something like the apple really exists in the external world. And the fact that we can perceive many of its qualities in different ways. For example, I can see that it's round as well as feel that it's a sphere. That also gives us more reason to believe that our ideas of the apple really resemble the apple as it is in itself. So to sum up, how does perception work? Well, we've seen Locke argue that perception works via mental intermediaries, that when I look upon the moon, I actually directly see an idea of the moon. So I'm perceiving the moon itself indirectly. There are various problems that Barclay raised for this, including the fact that ideas can only resemble ideas and that perhaps there's no need to posit an external world behind our ideas at all. But we've also seen that there are some replies that can be made to that. Um, as Locke points out, we lack control over our perceptions, implying that they really are outside of us. And as maybe Coburn points out, the coherence of our senses speak against the lack of material bodies causing them. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you.